All right, so time flies when you're having fun, right? And believe it or not, we are already heading into week four, which means we are entering chapter five uh, in our business communications class. I just wanted to do a quick lecture on chapter five and kind of hit the key points. I'm gonna be going through the lecture slides that you have available to you uh, underneath study tools. So at the bottom of each module, as stated before, you can go down to the bottom, you'll see a link for study tools. And if you'll link over to Cengage, it will take you directly to the study tools in each chapter. And uh, they have flashcards, but they also have lecture slides. So I'm using those lecture slides. Uh, so last week we talked about the fact that we are entering uh, in chapter four, five, and six, talking about this three by three writing process. And that three by three writing process is basically um, the pre-writing where we analyze the audience. And we did that in uh, part of chapter four. Uh, and then uh, the second part of that three by three writing process is the drafting and organizing. Um, we'll split that, the research, the organizing, and then of course drafting. And so then we'll eventually get to next week, which we'll be discussing more about um, revising and editing. Um, okay, so with organizing and drafting, uh, the first thing you need to um, take note of uh, in the slides and in the chapter is they discuss the two different types of uh, research methods. Now, obviously, if you are going to write uh, anything, uh, before you write anything, we do a little bit of research, whether you feel like you do or not, you do a, a small amount of research and the bigger the document and the more important the document, the more research you would do. And so um, there are some techniques and methods that you would use that we would call informal. That's when you're doing things like searching your company's files, if you go directly and talk to your uh, boss or maybe your lead, um, interviewing people that you would be writing to and kind of getting some feedback from them before you actually put together uh, a general uh, whatever it what might be an email or um, or memo or whatever the case may be and then possibly even a, even an informal survey and then we also have what we call formal research methods and those are going to be more like when you access data electronically you kind of go outside of the company um, with Google today we can get our hands on just about any information that we want uh, we have to be careful though that we are not bogged down with information that's not credible or information that's not um, clear and so we need to make sure in fact worthy you know it's that it's been checked uh, so uh, there are ways that we can uh, we have a whole module in this particular course where you can go to the library section module and it will click you over to um, our library and that can help you get a hold of a lot of credible uh, sources and journal articles um, magazines and uh, books and different things um, we want to investigate primary sources would also be considered a, a formal research method as well as um, possibly some scientific experiments um, there is uh, and of course I will be doing um, a review or that's my plan to do a review before the exam uh, but on our first exam I do think that they ask you at least one question uh, differentiating between uh, informal and formal research methods um, quick slide on social media brainstorming um, there is some information in the book where they talk about the difference between brainstorming and that's kind of we all think about getting in a room and just kind of yelling out different thoughts and jotting them down and then um, actually you know um, it's all about uh, quantity uh, instead of quality necessarily we're just getting as many ideas out as we can and that has its place but some people have decided that sometimes the quote-unquote loud mouth gets the most pull when we do brainstorming because people are just yelling out and introverts tend to just kind of fade out uh, whereas if we did brain writing um, where we would actually have people write down as many things and then kind of pull those together people wouldn't feel inferior or feel like they couldn't get their ideas out uh, three ways of social media brainstorming though crowdsourcing um, I don't know if a lot of you use Waze it's kind of like um, it's an app that you can use as you're driving it tells you where speed traps are it tells you where um, accidents have occurred where there's slow traffic um, it, and uh, they um, rely on and request that their uh, customers help to provide that that their uh, consumers and people that are, are using their app are supplying ideas and services in order for that to work they've got to plug in where they've just seen a cop or where they have been in slow traffic then we have what's called crowd storming and this requires the crowd um, to evaluate and filter the ideas into an actual product or plan uh, Lego is the example they give here where they put out a challenge to use Legos to create a 
uh, something that would illustrate Wizard of Oz. So they're putting something together, a viable product or plan. And then finally, crowdfunding. A lot of us are familiar with this. You'll see people put things up to try to raise money and finances for a specific venture or a cause. <coughs> Sorry. And that would be crowdfunding. And once we've done our research and we start pulling ideas together, we want to make sure in order for our writing to be coherent, and that means it flows from one thought to another thought, uh, we need to group those ideas together. And a lot of ways we can do that, but two of the most common ways are putting things into a list or doing an outline. Uh, there is an example of an outline in Chapter 5, and that might help you this week as you're working towards getting your outline together for your APA project. Um, here's some tips that you can go through for making sure you're getting together an effective and efficient outline. Um, make sure your main topics are pulled out. Um, what's the main purpose of what you're doing? Divide those main topics into three to five major components. Make sure that you're breaking major components into subpoints, and make sure you're using good details and illustrations as subpoints. Um, one thing that will help you if you'll look under your APA research project guidelines. Um, there is one, I think it's on step three, that you can click over to under the APA module, um, and it will actually show you some of those um, headings that you should be utilizing in your paper. You have an introduction, you have background, um, you have um, uh, discussion, and a conclusion. Use those in your outline, and that will help you to equate that to the exact breakdowns that the APA project is asking for. All right, and then we get into um, kind of the chunk of chapter five where they talk about some good writing techniques while you're drafting. Um, I, you, most of you, this will be very familiar to, uh, but basically they talk about the four basic sentence types. We have a simple, we have a compound, we have a compound complex, and then we also have um, uh, just a complex. So uh, the difference here is knowing the difference between what we would call an independent phrase or an independent sentence and a dependent phrase or dependent sentence or dependent clause, we would call it. Um, and both can have a subject, both can have a verb, but an independent clause is going to be able to stand on its own. It has those three key elements for being a sentence. It has a subject, it has a verb, and it makes sense all by itself. So I could say the baseball team is practicing today. That has a subject, it has a verb, and it completely makes sense. Um, but if I said when the baseball team practices, all of a sudden that doesn't make sense all on its own. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. It has a subject and a verb, but it just doesn't have a complete thought. It needs more to finish to be a complete thought. And that would be dependent. And so as long as you can tell the difference between one an independent phrases and a dependent, you should be able to identify and utilize all four sentence varieties. You have a simple, which is just one independent clause. Then you have what we call a compound sentence, and that's when we put two that could stand on their own together. And there's only three ways we can do that correctly, and the book shows you all three of those ways. We can do that with a comma and a conjunction, which they've done here on the slide. Um, and so we have Jade just graduated, that's independent. She applied for a job, that's independent. And when we hook those two together with a comma and a conjunction, we've got a complete compound sentence. Um, you can also do that with just a semicolon. You can also do it with a semicolon and a transitional expression and a comma. So check out your book for those three. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because I don't want the uh, lecture video to be too lengthy. Uh, we have what we call complex then, and that's when we have one independent and a dependent. So we have um, a clause that couldn't stand by itself before she applied for a job. So if I just ran into a room and said, good morning, before she applied for a job, See how that doesn't make sense just by itself. We need that other part. Jay prepared a resume. That could stand by itself. So when we have a dependent and an independent, we have what's called a complex sentence. And if the dependent, the weaker one comes first, we have to put a comma before we move into the independent. And then finally, we have a compound complex, and that's when we have two independents and at least one dependent. We can have more than one dependent, but we have two of what we talked about earlier going on with one complex. Um, then we have what's called compound complex. They also go into what we call the three most common sentence faults of writers, especially novice writers. We see a lot of times they write in fragments, which are broken sentences. Think of fragment meaning pieces, so it's just a piece of a sentence. And in their mind, when we're writing, a lot of time we fix. A lot of times we fix things in our mind. Um, but if we're just reading it and we're looking between in mark to in mark, what's in between those two in marks has to be able to stand on its own. It can't be just a piece. 
And so you'll see here, email seem boring as a subject and a verb, but when compared with Twitter, that doesn't stand by itself. Now, when you read the whole thing, email seem boring when compared to, with Twitter, that makes sense. And in your mind, you fix that like it's one sentence, but that's not what the punctuation here says. The punctuation here puts them as two independent sentences, and when compared with Twitter, that just isn't an independent sentence on its own. We also have what we call run-ons. Um, they are gonna ask you a couple questions on your test about this. They don't inundate you with questions about this grammar stuff, but there are two or three questions. Um, but a run-on is when we try to hook two complete sentences together, but we don't do it correctly in one of those three ways. Sometimes we'll just put a comma, and that's a comma splice, and we'll see that in a minute. Or sometimes we'll just hook two together with no punctuation, and that's called a fused. And so we need to be careful and make sure that we're putting the correct punctuation. So here they're giving you a comma splice, and they're showing you the difference. You could stop it here if you wanted to go through the different um, examples, as well as here. If you wanted to go back and stop there or you can just go directly to your uh, slides uh, sentence length remember we talked last week about short it's sweet it being short and sweet and hard to beat and so here it just shows you how the comprehension rate of a reader goes down the more words that are in a sentence so eight words is kind of that sweet spot where we have that 100% comprehension rate but notice as the words go up and double it begins to come down and then even four more words it comes down another 10 percent and then at 28 words people are only having about a 50 percent comprehension rate so that's why in business writing it's so important and it's more effective if we can say what we need to concisely um, we want to make sure we emphasize our important ideas use vivid words when you can if you need to pause here look at the difference in in what we would consider general writing and more vivid and specific writing um, sometimes you can label what is the main idea by saying words like most importantly um, and also we can achieve emphasis by putting um, the most important things at either the very beginning of the sentence or at the end of the sentence and that will uh, kind of help now we move into this thing called active and passive voice active and passive voice is very important they're gonna show you this again in another chapter at least one more chapter um, and when we use active voice, the subject is always performing the action. We lost money. Who lost the money? We did. The subject actually did it. We actually are the ones that lost the money. And a lot of times we want to write, actually most times we want to write in active voice. But if we want to de-emphasize something and we don't want to bring attention to who lost that money, then we might would when we're delivering negative news move to what we call a passive voice format. And so you see here it says money was lost. The money didn't actually do anything. Okay, it's not the actual um, person that did any. So at this point, the subject's not really performing the action. And when we move things like that, um, and you're gonna have two or three sentences in that first chapter five Canvas activity, where they're gonna ask you to switch it to from passive to active, and then two or three where they ask you to do the reverse. And so we gotta have an understanding of what active and passive are. And they have some examples for this in your text as well. Um, we want to be very direct, very consistent, very clear, very concise. And so they're showing you here how you can do that and go from something that's very indirect to it's not very clear to direct. We always want to be as direct as possible. There's few times when we're delivering negative news uh, that we might would want to use more of an indirect strategy. And we'll talk about that later when we get to the chapter on that. Um, and here's some more about use of uh, passive voice and uh, active voice when we need to use that. Take a look at those examples if you need to and pause and kind of see the difference there. And then we have something called parallelism. We're gonna have a couple of these on that activity as well. And so parallel means, just like you'd see two parallel lines running together, it means that the wording runs together, it's smooth. So if we're giving a list and we're giving a list of adjectives, we don't wanna do adjective, adjective, and then all of a sudden an adverb. We wanna do all adjectives, or if we're doing verbs or infinitives, we wanna to try to stay into uh, using all of those alike. So here you see an example that says, we focus on money, earning it, investing it, and how to spend it. So we had two gerunds that earning it and investing it, and then all of a sudden how to spend it. So if we left them all in ING form, it would have sounded better. We focus on money, earning it, investing it, and spending it. And so I think that might actually be one that they give you on the activity. And so there you can see the difference. So go ahead and pause it, read through these examples. It will help you tremendously. Um, 
uh, dangling modifiers are another thing. These can be kind of comical. Um, we don't think about it when we're writing, but like in the first uh, example, it says walking down the street, our sign is easy to see. And because we put the modifier by the subject sign, it makes it sound like the sign is actually walking down the street. And that's not really what we meant. So we wanna make sure the modifiers are as close to what they're modifying as possible. So take a look at those examples. Three different ways the slides go over and your text go over of how you can um, put together a paragraph. Most of the time we're gonna be using direct plan. Uh, especially in this course, but occasionally, like I said, when delivering negative news, you might go to indirect plan. And uh, we want to make sure that we're building what you keep hearing me say, coherent and concise paragraphs. Coherency means it flows. It moves from one idea to the next idea very easily. It's not where you have to stop and say, what, what were they saying? And kind of go back and reread it. The ideas are gonna kind of naturally flow from one to another. And there's a couple different um, effective techniques that you can use to create that coherency. One's called dovetailing, where you put a word in one, the end sentence, and then moving to the next, the first sentence of the next paragraph, you use that same word, and that will help. Um, sometimes you can do that with a pronoun, using the same, like putting a pronoun in the first sentence of a paragraph that's referring back to the antecedent in the last paragraph, and sometimes that can help. So basically, that's chapter five. Uh, we are gonna have a Q and A uh, this week on Monday evening at six. I kind of just go over uh, what the chapter four activities look like for me and some uh, things that I just wanna make sure everybody understood on chapter four, as well as giving some uh, hopefully clear instructions on chapter five. And then I'm gonna suggest that you, um, uh, that the students take a look at this video in order to help with chapter five. Uh, if you have questions, as always, please reach out, check the, the different things that I'm trying to um, make available to you, whether it's the lecture videos, the Q and A's that we're doing via Zoom calls and live synchronous learning, or um, simply emailing, texting, or calling me. Have a great week. Let me know.